Krishna. Great. Um, thank you. In fact, the only, the only tennis joke that comes to mind that's related to microservices is that one of my friends at my tennis club accused me of having a microserve. Hey. Ouch. You know, it hurt. But, it, but, it's, but it's actually remarkable in, in like, I don't know, seven years of doing microservices, that pun had never occurred to me uh, until he came up with it. So this is my talk on, on, the, on the essential characteristics of microservices. So basically, I'm going to talk about sort of the motivations for microservices, give a definition of, of give my definition of the microservice architecture, and then just talk about some of the design issues that you will face, as well as some of the development issues that you will face when, when using the microservice architecture. And I'm just because it sounds cute, I'm going to use shapes, series of visual metaphors. And, and most of them make sense, which is good. So before I you know, talk about that, a little bit about me, I've done a number of things over the years, um, uh, way back like in the late 80s, um, early 90s, I worked on Lisp systems. So I worked on um, implementations of Common Lisp, garbage collectors, compilers, IDEs, and all of that. Um, and then back in 2000, I wrote the book Projo's in Action back 13 years ago. Then back in 2007, no, 2008, I started tinkering around with this obscure service known as Amazon EC2, which is, you know, from an online bookstore. Blew my mind, ended up creating the original Cloud Foundry, so that was paths for deploying Java applications on EC2. That then got acquired by Spring Source, and then by VMware. And so I was part of those organizations, plus Pivotal, for four and a half years. Since then, I've been pretty much focused on the microservice architecture, travel around the world, um, doing consulting and training, or using around microservices, or, or using that as an excuse to eat really good food. And I must say that Singapore really wins the prize here. I've done nothing for three days except eat. <laughs> um, hike. Oh, I should say hike and sweat <laughs> a lot. Um, and I have a startup where we're building software to simplify the development of business applications that use the microservice architecture. And then my book, Microservices Patterns, came out back in November. And with that discount code, you can get it, and I believe other Manning products, for, for an amazing 40% off. Um, and I'll show it at the end, but it's, what's it? CTW, Yao, S, as in Singapore, 19. And then I also have the website microservices.io. So that's a destination where you go there and learn about microservices. And there's also a self-assessment tool, essentially a sophisticated questionnaire that you can use to self-assess your architecture. So that's me. I just do microservices and eat. And last night, I should mention that I discovered I prefer black pepper crab to chili crab, because, <laughs> I, I, well, we ordered both of them. <laughs> Um, and I'm still digesting. <laughs> so anyway, back to the talk. Um, so as I mentioned, a series of sort of visual metaphors, success triangle, scale cube, hexagonal architecture, and so on. So I'm going to start off by talking about the success triangle, which I sort of view as the kind of the three factors that you need in order to deliver software successfully in, in sort of this modern age. Um, and if I was to, obviously, part of that is the microservice architecture. And if I was to sort of sum up a huge motivation for change in, in for us as IT developers, it's really on this slide. So software is eating the world, right? Which basically means that every company has to master the ability, the, the, the skills to d deliver software. You know, it doesn't matter if, obviously, banks have been doing that for some time. But if you're a mining company, you know, it's all about software as well as things that dig and so on. Or governments, apparently, it's all about software. You know, it's sort of like how businesses engage with their customers or their citizens and so on. And then, you know, in the private sector, the marketplace within which businesses are operating are becoming increasingly volatile and uncertain. Mm -hmm. Competitors arise out of new nowhere. There's regulatory changes and so on. And that actually means that businesses need to innovate faster. They need to deliver 
new products and new services and iterate on those products and services at a much faster rate than they did before. And what that means for us as software developers is we need to deliver software much more rapidly, much more frequently, and much more reliably. And obviously not just by like throwing more coal on the fire, to use Greg Gregor's metaphor. So you can quantify rapid, frequent, and reliable delivery with a few different metrics. So the first two metrics concern velocity. One of those metrics is lead time, minimizing the amount of time from a developer committing that change to that change going into production. You want to shrink that as much as possible. And just to give you a hint, that's today that should be measured in minutes, not hours, weeks, or days, or, or months, or anything like that. And you also want to increase your deployment frequency. And the unit for that is deploys per developers per day. So you want to be constantly pushing changes into production many times a day. And the idea is every developer commits the changes, and those changes get built, tested, and deployed automatically. So it's about moving very rapidly. It's also about doing it in a very safe, reliable way. And there's some metrics around that. Change failure rate. How often does what percentage of deployments result in an outage? Obviously, that needs to be as close to zero as possible. And then if there is an outage, how quickly can you recover from it? And it was interesting. Gregor had a few things to mention about that as well. So there's some, you know, so those are the key metrics. So that, that drives, ultimately ends up driving software processes and software architectures. And then another factor, which I'm sure many of you are experiencing on a daily basis, if you're successful, if your application is successful, it has a habit of living for a very, very long time. Um, you know, like last week at the conference, there were people who were programming in, I think it was PL1, right? You know, which in a sense is an absolutely ancient technology. But someone way back built an incredibly successful application using that, using that technology, and it's still central to the business today. Um, which on the one hand is great. You've actually survived that long. The trouble is, technology changes, right? You might, you know, it's sort of not a hot, desirable job to be a PL1 programmer or a C++ programmer today even, right? You know, because all the cool kids want to use Java and Golang, apparently Node, strange. <laughs> so anyway, you want to be able to easily modernize your applications. You know, so rather than being stuck with absolutely ancient technology, which is increasingly getting out of date and really hard to hire for, you want to be able to modernize your technology stack. So I sort of view the way you achieve those goals, delivering software rapidly, frequently, and reliably, to, and to have long-lived applications, that requires a combination of three things, process, organization, and architecture. So today, process actually means using lean product development methodology combined with DevOps for actual software delivery. And DevOps is really an umbrella term that encompasses things like continuous delivery, continuous deployment, with, with Agile mixed in there as well. So that's your process. Um, and it's interesting that Gregor mentioned organization as well. So you know, there, instead of having siloed organizational sort of structures where Dev writes code, apparently doesn't test it, gives it to QA who tests it, and then gives it to ops, what you really want are small cross-functional autonomous teams that have on them all of the capabilities <laughs> to take concept, implement it, test it, and deploy it. So get it eliminating the handoffs between the different silos, which possibly also have conflicting goals, right? Like ops wants to change, or ops wants stability, but developers want to change things. So then that leads to architecture. Um, so you, you need an architecture to enable DevOps. You need an architecture to enable these small cross-functional teams as well. And given that this is a talk about microservices, you can imagine that sometimes that is the answer. Um, so but I want to talk about why. And that leads to part two of this talk, which is the scale cube, which I will get to later. But that was sort of how I got in, into microservices. So you know, if you think about what kind of architecture you need 
in order to support DevOps, in order to support autonomous teams, and in also in order to support these long-lived applications, you need an architecture that's highly testable, highly deployable, and highly maintainable. I mean, that, those are sort of the basic requirements to actually do DevOps. Um, in particular, it needs to be automated, te tested using automated tests. Um, to support the autonomous teams, if we apply Conway's law, which says that the architecture and the team structure are basically mirrors of one another, if you want to have loosely coupled teams, you actually need a loosely coupled modular architecture. So those two things go hand in hand. And then finally, for, to have a long-lived application that you can evolve over time to, to take advantage of new technology, you also need a highly modular architecture that lets you replace parts of it incrementally. And you just need this general kind of attribute of evolvability as well. So those the, that's the architecture that we need. So if we go look at a monolithic application, um, and most applications that I built over the years until, I don't know, 2011, 2012, kind of looked like this. So internally, they were actually layered. They had some modules and so on. But everything was packaged up as a single deployable unit. So in Java, this was a war file. Um, in some other language, you, there would be a way, some equivalent deployable unit or executable. So that's the monolithic architecture. That, this architecture is not an anti-pattern and can be a good choice because if you have a small monolith, it can be highly testable, deployable, maintainable, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. The problem you have is that applications have a habit of growing. So you start off with a tiny little application, but then little by little, the developers are making it bigger and bigger because they're adding new features. Every day they're committing their tested 20 lines of code or whatever that metric is. Um, so the application is getting bigger, the development team is getting bigger, so the actual rate of change is even increasing as well. Um, and then you might try and split up the team into a team of teams, but ultimately they're all contributing to the same code base, and things just tend to get slower and slower, if for no other reason than the sheer size of the application. And then probably at some point modularity breaks down because the code base is too large to fit in any developer's head, right? And if you don't understand it, it's difficult to change. You're likely to um, kind of make sort of quick choices and break and, and ignore service boundaries, especially because in languages like Java, there's not really an effective module um, modularity mechanism. So you end up ultimately with a big ball of mud that's even worse, and that's a downward spiral. And then, as I mentioned, your technology stack is getting out of date, literally day by day. You know, the, the fantastic new framework that you picked back in the year 2000, you know, 19 years later, is getting kind of out of date, right? Even the programming language that you picked perhaps is not so exciting anymore. You know, I've talked with clients who had apps that are 20 years old and they're written in some ancient 4GL from a database company that no longer exists, but they're absolutely mission critical to, you know, for their business. So not an uncommon situation, and I'm sure some of you in this room are, are, are you know, this is your daily existence, right? Which is what I call monolithic hell. And if I was to draw this, you know, picture you know, as a graph, right? You know, as, this, as the size and the complexity of your application, its value increases over time, that all of those desirable illities kind of go, go in the opposite direction. So your ability to deliver software rapidly and frequently and reliably just declines over time. And this is usually a problem because since software is eating the world, you actually need to be going faster, not slower. So there really is this risk of disruption to your business, which actually could pose an existential threat. You know, for instance, I think like in Hong Kong, was it like eight virtual banks were licensed overnight. Suddenly the incumbent physical banks, you know, they had eight new competitors. Or in the gig economy, there's an insurance company that offers hourly insurance for um, 
gig workers like at Lyft and at Uber, right? And so imagine you're working for an insurance company with your ancient mainframe systems. Can you really uh, you know, adapt that quickly and offer hourly insurance? Perhaps not. So th those kinds of changes can ultimately pose an existential threat to your business. So what can you do about it? So 10 years ago, nine, 10 years ago now, I, I read this book, The Art of Scalability, which was written by some folks who worked at <coughs> eBay, one of the original sort of thought leaders in large scale applications. And in the book, they had this three dimensional model of scaling. So three different dimensions. X-axis scaling is running multiple copies of your monolith behind a, a standard load balancer. We do that all the time. Z-axis scaling is running multiple copies of your monolith behind a load balancer that uses some attribute of the request to route that request accordingly. So some requ you know, requests for one, some customers get routed to destination A, requests for other customers get routed to destination B, and so on. At the database level, that would be called sharding, quite a common technique. But both X and Z axis of scaling are all about scaling the monolith. But then there's Y axis scaling or functional decomposition, which is where you basically break up what would otherwise be a monolithic application into a set of smaller applications, or in other words, services. And for the most part, this was sort of my, you know, this to me kind of is what got me thinking about the microservice architecture. Especially at the time, the original Cloud Foundry was a monolith, and had we broken it apart like this, it would have solved a number of sort of development and operational challenges. So, so that's kind of the, the essence of the microservice architecture. It's really functional decomposition. The other sort of a more detailed way of explaining this is that it's an architectural style that structures an application as a set of services. And each service, I hate, actually hate the term microservice because that implies tiny, which I think is quite misleading. Um, it really, it's just, does, it's not helpful. So for me, you know, micro, an individual service is highly maintainable and testable. Right. It actually has to be loosely coupled with other services because of the requirement for modularity in order to support the loosely coupled teams, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, it has to be independently deployable because deployability is a key thing. So it, in its, it has to essentially be an application or a deployable unit or executable in its own right. It tends to be it tends to implement a business capability or a business function. Um, so one reason for that is that sort of the business, the functions that your business implements tend to be somewhat stable. So if your technical architecture mirrors that, then they are also stable. And then also, and this is the last point, which is really important and kind of says something about the size of a service, it should be owned by a small team. So if you have a large team owning a service, it's, you're not really doing microservices at this point because small teams are teams that are highly productive. And the larger the team gets, the less productive it gets. Now, in terms of ser how many services should you have, a good starting point is actually just to have one service per team because that's all you need to enable team autonomy. So despite what some companies like Uber would say, where, hey, we've got a service per developer, right? I mean, in my opinion, that's far too complex, far too fine-grained an architecture. So I think in an enterprise setting, just have, have a relatively coarse-grained architecture. Now, in the case of microservices.io, oh, sorry, food to go um, so earlier I showed the monolithic version, right? So in the microservice version, it would look like this. You'd have a bunch of services, each one of which implements a, a business function or business capability like order management, delivery management, and so on. Each one of the services has its own database. That's important for loose coupling that I will talk about in a minute. Um, it, the services often, for reasons I will also talk about, communicate asynchronously. Um, and you can also, oh, I should also say, you can functionally decompose the web tier as well. 
Sitting in front of them is an API gateway that basically defines the external API for those services. And in this case, is invoked by JavaScript and, and, and running in a browser, and also by a mobile application. So that's sort of kind of the, bi the big picture view. And obviously, as you can see, it's, it's kind of a bit complicated. Lots of moving parts, which hints at sort of some of the drawbacks of this approach. But in terms of benefits, right, you, it, you get much better testability, um, maintainability, because the services are basically much smaller applications. They fit in a developer's head, which is really, really important. They're obviously, by definition, independently deployable. This is quite a modular architecture, right? The, the module boundaries are actually basically sort of remote APIs, so you can't bypass them and in access sort of the private internals of an actual service. And what's really important, this, is a, this, the, uh, this architecture is highly evolvable as well. You, you no longer are required to use the same technology stack for each service. It lets you upgrade on, in an incremental way. Um, but by far, sort of the best way that su kind of summarizes this is to relate it back to the success triangle. So the microservice architecture gives you the testability and the deployability that you need in order to do DevOps. And it also ha gives you the illities that are required to support to enable you to have long-lived applications. And also the modular, the modular nature of this architecture does an excellent job of supporting, uh, of enabling the teams to be autonomous as well. Each team can develop and test and deploy and scale their service independently of the other teams. And that's really important. But, but you know, in the interest of full disclosure, there are some drawbacks. You already got a sense of that it's a lot more complex. You're building a distributed system, so there are quite complex issues around development. Um, testing, in a sense, is simultaneously easier and harder. And I'll talk about some of that later. Deployment, while it's sort of each service is independently deployable, you basically have an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude more moving parts in production that all need to be monitored and managed and orchestrated and so on. So it's all, all a bit complicated. Um, defining service boundaries is tricky. And if you get it wrong, it's really, really bad. That actually can slow you down and not make you go faster. And then also the act of taking a monolith and incrementally migrating it into a set of services is extremely time-consuming and painful. Um, but, but people have done this, so you can do it too. OK, so that's the definition, the essential definition of the microservice architecture. I now want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the, the hexagonal architecture, which is a good way of thinking about the, the individual structure of each service. So we like to use the three-tier three architecture, right, where you've got the presentation layer, the business logic layer, and the database access layer. You know, that's sort of the standard way of, like, structuring it where we think that our system is structured. But it tends not to actually be a good reflect. It doesn't actually, it's not actually accurate. Um, some of the dependencies are, in fact, the other way around, or they should be the other way around. And it's not sufficiently flexible. So for this reason, I actually like the hexagonal architecture, which places the business logic at the center of the application. Then the business logic exposes or has a number of ports, which are basically interfaces, like literally interfaces in a Java application. Some ports are inbound, so that enables the business logic to be invoked. Other ports are outbound, which enables which enables the business logic to invoke other things, access the database, interact with message broker, invoke some other service. So that's sort of the internal, that's the, you know, the most important part of the application is its business logic. And then around the outside, there are various adapters which handle, like, for example, inbound requests. So an inbound adapter will invoke the business logic using an inbound port. 
there were also outbound adapters, which actually, like in this case, the data access object it implements the interface that defines the outbound port. Um, and then there are other ports as well, like for doing messaging and also for invoking other services. So that's sort of a nice model, a much better way of thinking about the architecture of your service. Now, how that relates back to, to actual services is as follows. So the whole point of a microservice is to expose an API to its consumers, right? That's its reason for existing. So if you're on a order management team, your whole job is around implementing the order management API. An API consists of two parts. It has operations, um, which can be invoked by the consumers. There's two types of operations, commands which change data, place an order, cancel an order. There's queries that retrieve data, find order, find order history, and so on. These operations can be invoked either synchronously, which is our standard way of doing it, but for reasons I'll get into later, it's often desirable to invoke them <coughs> asynchronously. Um, you know, basically by sending messages via a message bus broker. That's, that's sort of the standard approach. The other part of an API are the events that are emitted by the service. So these, in, if you're familiar with domain-driven design, would be domain events. So when a, when the, when a business object is created, or updated, an event would be emitted, like order created, order canceled, and so on. So the API is the most important part of the service, but a service also has dependencies. So it can invoke operations that are implemented by other services. And then it can also subscribe to events that are implemented, that are published by other services as well. So that's sort of the kind of the developer view of, of, of a service. So like in the case of the order service in the example application in my book, it implements a create order operation that's, that's a post. It emits order create events, and then it's primarily collaborating asynchronously with other services. So there's also an operational aspect to a service as well. So it, has, it supports externalized configuration for passing in configuration properties like database, like the database IP address and credentials. It will typically do lower logging is also essential. It will also implement a health check API as well, like slash health or slash HC, so the runtime can um, check up on the health of a service. Um, it should expose metrics as well to a metrics collection system and it should support distributed tracing as well, um, which is really, really useful for debugging. That's kind of a key observability pattern. So that's sort of the struct, so that's sort of the production ready nature of a service. And normally many of these capabilities would be provided by a, what I call a microservice chassis framework, such as Spring Boot or Spring Cloud if you work in the Java space. And there are analogous ones in other, for other languages as well. OK, so that's sort of the structure of an individual service. Now I want to talk a little bit about coupling, um, beginning with icebergs, which, yes, it's not a, a geometric shape, but I think of them as triangles. So services collaborate. Like, so for instance, the order service might actually have to reserve credit by invoking the customer service. You know, assuming customers have a credit limit. So some amount of coupling is inevitable because, the, because of the collaborative nature of these services. But you want to make sure that this, this coupling is what, what is defined as loose, right? There's actually two types of coupling. Runtime coupling, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but that arises when services synchronously invoke one another. And then there's design time coupling, um, which I'm going to talk about now, and that's where one changing one service, such as the customer service, regularly causes other services to be changed in lockstep. And th this is particularly problematic because design time coupling requires the teams to collaborate and coordinate their work, right? 
like I'm working on the customer service and oh dear, I need to make a change that's bat that is breaking to the customer service API. So I now need to meet and, and coord plan that change with all of the other teams. You know, so you've got to schedule meetings. You have to get a meeting room, which I'm sure is challenging in most of your companies. It's like a universal truth as far as I can tell. Never enough meeting rooms. And whenever you have to coordinate across teams, it slows down development quite a lot. So it's really important to, ascend, to, to minimize the amount of coupling. So you want to have stable, well-designed APIs that do a really good job of encapsulating the internals of the service so that they can be changed regularly. And you want to be careful with things like shared libraries, especially ones that contain business logic. Because if the rules that that business logic implement change, then all of the, light, all of the services have to be updated in, in lockstep. So I like to think of services as looking like icebergs, where they have a relatively small API um, and, a, and a relatively large implementation. So you know, a good example of this is if you think about Twilio the messaging system, there's an operation like send text message. Right, it's kind of like phone number, message. A bit more complicated than that in reality, but that's a great API because it that it's very small, but it actually behind it is a really complex implementation. Um, and likewise, you know, with with Stripe for doing payments, it's like charge credit card. Right behind that, it's a really complex implementation. And that's great because you can, the team that owns the service can keep enhancing the implementation without introducing breaking changes to the API. Now you contrast this with, the, with an anti pattern where you've got a service that's basically all API and no implementation, like it's just a wrapper around the database. Guaranteed if that database change, the database schema changes, the API will change, which will then cause other services to be updated um, at the same time, and that can just ripple throughout your system. And that's deeply problematic. And similarly, sharing database tables is a really problematic kind of implementation coupling, because for instance, imagine if the order service accessed the customer table directly, well, that would mean that whenever the customer table, customer team wanted to change that schema, they'd have to coordinate that work with the other, with the order team and everyone else. And you know, you end up in a situation in a lot of enterprises where it becomes impossible to change anything. Um, so basically, databases are an implementation detail that are, that are encapsulated by an API. And that's actually kind of a big change in a lot of enterprises, which I get the people in enterprises always think about their database tables, right? And it's like, oh, I want to access that table and that table. And really in the microservice world, it's all about APIs and services, and we don't talk about databases. OK, so that, that's how to deal with um, design time coupling and how to minimize it. And interestingly, this design time coupling is really, I mean, that's one of the core problems in software, right? It's like, how do you break things up into pieces that can evolve in different ways and still work together? So the other thing I want to talk about, um, using the cylinder metaphor, um, so I guess that's a real shape, right, is, is relying on asynchronous messaging. Now today, I mean, we all just love to use this was in Martin's talk as well, right? We always, we love to use REST because, well, because we do, right? But the, that can be deeply problematic. So let's imagine that you had implemented the order service so that it worked like this. Post request comes in to create an order. Partway through doing that, the order service then makes a put request to the customer service to reserve credit. And then it's sitting there waiting for the customer service to respond. Response comes back. The order service responds to its client. Superficially, that's super simple, right? The problem that you run into is that when well, you can't create orders unless both the order service and the customer service are up and running at the same time. Um, so 
you know, mathematically, the availability of the create order endpoint is a product of the availability of, this, of the two services. So it's gone from highly, well, you want it to be highly available, but clearly it is not. Um, and really, this is sort of a symptom of a common design sort of anti-pattern where you just think, well, we had a bunch of modules in our monolith, and they just communicated, and so we just turn them into services. And instead of method calls, we'll replace it with REST, and everything will be fine, right? Or, or gRPC, it doesn't really matter. Um, but the obvious problem is, well, when you've got latency, that can kill you, right? But also, you've got this synchronous sort of runtime coupling where essentially every, any one of those services in, that, in a chain is a single point of failure. So you've got this incredibly brittle architecture you know, where the availability of, the end, of a given endpoint is the availability of an individual service to the power N. So it you know, becomes highly unavailable or less than highly available quite quickly. Um, so for that reason, you want to, particularly when implementing commands, which are doing updates, you want to rely quite heavily on asynchronous messaging. And I sort of like, like to recommend Gregor's book, right, um, Enterprise Integration Patterns, because that has a great pattern language for thinking about messaging systems. Um, so the idea, right, is a sender sends a message, and a message is comprised of headers, metadata, and a payload through it to a message channel, and that message is read by a recipient. Um, and there's a whole very rich pattern language in the book, but basically the channel is an abstraction over whatever messaging capabilities your broker provides. So it could actually be an Apache Kafka topic or a JMSQ or, or topic. But you, it's sort of an, an abstract way to, to model things, and I find that quite useful. So at a higher level, how do you make use of them inside a microservice architecture? Well, so one version of one way to make the order service more available is to use the Saga pattern, which is a way of doing implementing transactions that span multiple services in a microservice architecture. And I cover it thoroughly in my book, Chapter 4. So you should check that out. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is a really simple example of actually specifically what's known as choreography-based saga. So in this example, you know, the, the create request actually respond, returns immediately. So it's actually saying, well, the order ID is this. But uh, by the way, I can't tell you the outcome of the creation, right? Because this, in this architecture, that then happens. The finalization of the order is done asynchronously. So the order service publishing is, is an, an event saying, hey, I've created an order for this customer. Customer service gets that event and then attempts to reserve credit. And then we'll publish an event saying the credit has been reserved or the credit has been um, limit has been exceeded, the order service then gets that event, changes the status of the order to approved. So this is an eventually consistent model, where once the dust settles, the order has been created or not, and the credit has been reserved or not. And this is kind of nice, because the availability of create order is now the availability of the order service. Um, so the order service can keep accepting orders and trying to approve them, even though other services in the system are, are not available. Um, so that actually works quite well. The drawback is you have the complexity of sagas, um, but in a and there's some very sub subtle issues. And actually, if you go to my, in, in all seriousness, if you read my book or go to my blog, um, I talk about some of those issues in, in, in a lot of details. Um, and then the other, the other complication is, is that the, the response to the post doesn't contain the outcome. It just says the order request has been accepted and the order ID is this, and the client kind of has to check back. So it's, it's doing more work. Um, 
But interestingly, this saga pattern is actually how you implement transactions in a microservice architecture. I think <laughs> Martin in his talk did mention that like two-phase commit in XA is a fundamentally flawed mechanism. So in, my, in microservice architecture, sagas is what you need, but there are some subtle complexities to them. So the other, the other option is actually to replicate data using a pattern which often goes by the name of command query responsibility segregation. Quite a mouthful, but it's basically an event-driven way of replicating data to where it's needed. And there's a couple of different uses for this. The other use is to implement high-performance scalable queries. Here, what it's, what's ha actually happening is the credit limit is actually replicated to the, or, to the order service. And the order service is now responsible for keeping track of the available credit. That's no longer maintained by the customer service. So that means that in this simplistic example, the order service has all of the data that it needs in order to validate an order because it has the available credit there locally. Um, and that, that increases the availability of the system um, it also means that the response can actually contain the outcome of validation. But you do have the complexity and cost of, of replicating data. So when I was in Australia last week, I made the joke that there's only 20 million people living in, in Australia, so how much data is there to replicate? Um, and I guess it's even easier in Singapore, right? Not quite sure what the, what the population is. Okay, yeah, so at most you've got six million customers, right? So much more manageable laptop scale kind of database replication. I'm mostly joking. <laughs> um, you can get some pretty powerful laptops though, right? <laughs> um, 32 gig MacBook Pro 8 core processor. You can do a lot with that. Um, anyway, but, but anyway, so those are a couple of patterns that are relying on, so the fundamentally they're relying on asynchronous communication to either implement sort of distributed transactions or the, the, a better form of distributed transactions or they're using it to replicate data in, in an asynchronous event-driven way. So though it all seems a bit complicated, and in a sense it is, but the sort of the trade-off is, well, we've got these loosely coupled services that we can develop and test and deploy independently. Um, so that, that it, it can be a, a worthwhile trade-off. But, but in each situation, you do need to properly evaluate the pros and cons. So the last thing I want to talk about is testing. Um, and it really just blows my mind that Facebook kind of gets away with, a whole, with, with limited testing. I want to talk with Kent about that. Um, even though he's my hero, I, I kind of want to argue with him. I, I, <laughs> slight aside, I met Kent 20 years ago, and, right, and I got him to sign a copy of, my, of the XP book, and I said, you know, Kent, you're my hero. So, and he wrote in my book, you're one sad puppy. <laughs> so I, I, I treasure that. Um, okay, so yeah, um, testing. So from my perspective, um, like, so the whole, why are we doing microservices? Well, it's to do DevOps, right? And a key part of DevOps is automation, and a part of that is automated testing. And then the kind of the complexity of the microservice architecture actually requires a lot of automated testing. Um, so, in a set, so if you're doing microservices without automated testing, arguably it's like self-defeating and it's really, really risky. Um, but sadly, I've actually encountered a number of companies who have gone down that path. And I, I wrote this up, I wrote up a series of anti-patterns of microservices adoption. And one of them is trying to fly before you can walk. You know, if you're, in, you know, if you're embracing the microservice architecture, 
you have to simultaneously get very serious about automated testing, or, or it will not go well. And the sad thing is, if you survey the industry, this is from the 2018 State of Testing report, 72% of organizations are still relying very heavily on manual testing. And ironically, it's like 90, 89, and 90% of organizations want to do DevOps and Agile, and it's like total mismatch. So a key testing concept is actually the, the test pyramid. So this, this is really the final shape of the day. And what it's showing are the relative proportions of the types of tests that you need to write. And essentially, you want to push testing as far down the pyramid as possible. And the reason for that is that, is that the tests at the bottom of the pyramid are reliable. They don't fail randomly, like, because it's Monday. They, they're very fast to execute because unit tests in particular are all in memory. So you're not sort of doing networking or, or hitting the disk or anything like that. And they're relatively straightforward to test. So, you know, you work at a bank and you've, you, you, you wanna cal you've got some code that calculates the repayment schedule for a loan. You want to test the heck out of that at the, at the unit test level. Right, dealing with all the complex edge conditions and so on, because you can test that very effectively. Now, once you move up the stack, the tests get increasingly more brittle, as in more likely to fail just for random reasons. They, they, and then because of the amount of networking and I.O. in general, they, they become a much slower, and they tend to be much more complex to write. Um, so unit tests, testing the individual classes, within a service, in a sense, that's absolutely not any different than testing inside a monolith. Integration testing is testing the, the adapters that are integrating with other things. Component testing is a form of acceptance testing um, for, you, for an individual service. That's actually the first point at which you have a fully assembled service and you're testing it. And then end-to-end -end testing, which is really not drawn to scale, and, or perhaps shouldn't even be that, is where you're testing the whole system. Obviously, the path from developer machine to production is the automated deployment pipeline that runs a series of tests. Each service should have its own independent deployment pipeline. Right? So the order team, they're developing, committing, their changes are automatically being built, tested, and ideally deployed into production while the kitchen team is doing the same thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about end-to-end -end testing and why it's problematic in the middle in a minute. But I want to mention very briefly one of the key ideas that's quite distinctive to the microservice architecture, and that is consumer-driven contract testing. You want to be able to test services independently while being conf confident that when you put them together, they can actually communicate. So my example, right, the API gateway invokes the your service using REST. And the way you do this is with consumer-driven contract testing. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do that. But like in the case of Spring Cloud Contract, you write, you kind of describe the expected behavior with a series of contracts that are, that are example, in this case, example request response pairs. So that's what this, this groovy document is. And there's other ways of writing this. And if you're using messaging, it's not request response, it's kind of different, but equivalent. So it's like, this is like API definition by example. Then on the consumer side, you can test the order service proxy, which is the adapter class that's in the API gateway that's making requests to the API gateway server, to the, to the order service. Those contracts are actually used to configure a simulator of the order service. So we're testing this class, and it thinks it's making HTTP requests to the real order service, but it's actually a test double. Um, and you, like my example, I use YMOC, which is one of the several service virtualization frameworks. So, but that's the point. We're testing in isolation, but then those same contracts are then used to test the service 
the actual contracts are written by the API gateway team, and they, then they give them to the order team, who then uses them to test the order controller that's the adapt class that is handling the inbound HTTP request. And the idea, I mean, there's a whole bunch of details that I'm skipping over, but the idea is you take, you use the same contracts and you test the consumer and the provider with them. And well, hey, if they work independently, when you put them together, they must agree, they, by definition, they must agree on the structure of the API. Fingers crossed. So that's contract-driven testing in a nutshell. Hugely important. But and the reason it's important is that you try and avoid end-to-end -end testing because end-to-end -end tests are brittle, slow, and complex. So you could actually have this sort of structure. And you have these slow, tedious, constantly breaking end-to-end -end tests. But imagine this. You, know, you have a production outage and you quickly want to get a new change into production. It has to go through this potential bottleneck. And, and so the kind of the thinking about this is to actually avoid end-to-end -end testing. Um, and if you want to have a better name, so the idea is you can call it te this, te this concept of testing in production. Or if that frightens the business people, you call it validation in production, right? <laughs> But, but the basic idea is this end-to-end -end testing is just a total bottleneck. It's not guaranteed to catch all of your bugs anyway, especially because your end-to-end -end environment is a mere simulation in production. So you've got to get things into production as fast as possible because that's when they encounter reality. And you need mechanisms in place in your production environment to quickly, like, um, deal with, faith, detect and deal with and recover from failure. So one key idea is you separate deployment from release, right? So deployment is the act of running in production. Release is actually making it available to users. So you actually deploy code, test it, and then gradually release it with appropriate monitoring mechanism. So I'll quickly step through this because I'm, I'm almost out of time. Actually, I'm, I'm out of time. So, for instance, you deploy version 2 side by side with version 1 behind an intelligent traffic router. So you might be using one of these newfangled service meshes like Istio. Um, but at this point, you've configured the, the routing rules not to route any traffic to version 2. Then you can test it. It's safe. It's running, but it's not getting production traffic. And then you can start routing test traffic to it. And then little by little, you can actually start ramping out the percentage of traffic just by changing the, product, changing the routing rules until all of the, ideally, all of the production traffic is running, is being routed to version 2. But, and, but you're monitoring it carefully. And if you detect a problem like a spike in 500s or a, sp or a, a spike in latency, you change the routing rules and all of the traffic just goes back to version one and you can debug the problem. So that's sort of kind of one of the key ideas for testing in production. And there's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, at Copy Construct, Cindy Sridharan on, on Twitter has written about this. Anyway, that's, that's basically my presentation, right? So briefly summarizing, right? You know, the success triangle is the goal. That's how you rapidly um, and frequently and, um, deliver software that the scale cube sort of defines the microservice architecture that has all of the architectural qualities that you need. The hexagonal architecture defines the structure of the individual services. Um, you want to design them so that they are like icebergs with those tiny API that encapsulates the implementation details. You want to use asynchronous messaging as much as possible. And you want to um, do automated testing according to the test pyramid. So that's my talk. Hope that you found it useful. And, and thank you for listening.